Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And real quick, before we get started, just go ahead and hit that like button so everybody knows that you like this video. Hit the subscribe button so that you are subscribed to this channel and hit the notification bell so that you get notified each and every time we drop some brand new fire content on this page. Now, I'm flying solo today, as you can see. BQ couldn't be with us today. He had some previous prior obligations that he had to get tended to. But don't worry. Your boy is here. I'm going to hold us down. And we're going to have us uh, a, a nice little time today. Let the church say amen. All right. So um, this past weekend, Impact Wrestling held its tapings in Philadelphia and uh, at the 2300 Arena, the old ECW Arena. And they are currently taped up all the way through Rebellion. So, um, you know, everything's in the can, in the bag. Uh, I've heard that they might, according to uh, Mike Johnson, PW Insider, they might actually tape some more content WrestleMania weekend. But for the most part, everything is in the bag. The, the, the hay is in the barn. And the road to Rebellion is all set. And, um, you know... We're just going to take this ride. We're going to take this ride. But one of the things that came out of this past weekend was uh, one of our favorites, Chelsea Green. She was letting us, the fans, have it um, because apparently she got one over on us all. She revealed that her wrist was actually not broken and that she would be turning on Mickey James and revealing to her that her wrist was not broken. And Chelsea Green was so proud of this swerve that she pulled. She was gloating on her Twitter, posting videos from her hotel room with no cast on. And she showed backstage before she took the cast off and I guess went to attack Mickey James. Is that what happened? I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't in the building. But maybe. I guess we're all going to find out this on this week's upcoming episode of Impact how exactly it all played out. But at least we know that the payoff is coming this week. I mean, they've been very deliberate with this storytelling. We could see that there was a Chelsea Green turn on Mickey James coming up. We just weren't exactly sure how it was going to play out. Um, <clears throat> so I'm guessing we're going to get, we're going to finally get the big turn this week. And here's the thing that I actually do find interesting. Though. I have to say, with so much attention being paid to the Chelsea Green and Mickey James story. And with Deanna Perrazzo being well established, having been a knockouts champ for a good amount of time, and doing her champ champ challenge, which is basically, you know, the Deanna Perrazzo invitational. She's the person completely carrying those segments, right? It's all about her and just putting somebody in the ring with her that she's gonna, you know, tap out. Um I'm a little worried that the knockouts champion Tasha Steels is fighting for, like, third place amongst the knockout stories right now. And Ta Tasha Stills, man, she's got to she's gotta make sure she stays hot. She's got to make sure she stays hot and on top of the fans' minds so that she gets a good reaction when she comes out. I love seeing that they actually have multiple good knockout stories going on at once, but Tasha Stills got to be very careful to not let herself get pushed too far in the background with these other stories going on. It's one thing... Uh, for what the uh, what 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 what's being written and presented on the show, that the performers can't do anything about. But the performers do have to find ways to go out of their ways to go above and beyond to promote themselves. I I saw a couple of things that actually really reinforced this philosophy lately. Um, <clears throat> one was I saw the uh, the Netflix Kanye West documentary. It's called Genius. Uh, and if you guys haven't seen it, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Um, not just if you're a Kanye West fan or if you're a Kanye West hater, but it's actually a really just amazing amount of detail into the the behind the scenes life and the journey of someone who's become like a cultural phenomenon. Right. Like at this point, that's what Kanye West is. Kanye West has become a cultural phenomenon. He's not he's not just a music artist. He's not just a producer. He's not just a celebrity. Right. Like he's Kanye West has become a, a cultural phenomenon. And in the documentary Genius, you get to see how he. While maybe not solely responsible for his fame, he was 
by far the driving engine behind his fame. And if it wasn't for him, he would have gotten left in the dust a long, long, long time ago. But it was his own work ethic and his own ability to continuously promote himself, right? You have a, a, a record label, right, that is... Their job is to distribute your content, to promote your albums, and all that other stuff. But they're only going to do so much. And the truth is, unless they already see you as a hot property, they're only going to invest but so much time, so much energy, so much resources, okay, into promoting you, right? So how do I relate this to, to Impact Wrestling? is what I'm talking about right now. Look at it like, um, so I mentioned Tasha Stills, right? And are they going above and beyond to promote Tasha Stills? No. Now, let's say, let's just say John Cena, right, decided he wanted to come to Impact Wrestling and take on a challenge. Impact Wrestling and Anthem Exhibitions would spare no expense at promoting the fact that they had John Cena. Because they already know and believe that the John Cena name is going to attract people in. So if the company believes that promoting you is going to get more dollars back, they'll spend the money to promote you. So what does that mean? That means that all of these wrestlers have to go above and beyond on their own to promote themselves. i give you another example. <clears throat> I'm currently reading uh, Will Smith's book, Will, uh, not Will. Will. <laughs> it's um it's obviously his self-titled autobiography, but he talks a lot about, you know, about his career and how he learned what it took to become the biggest movie star in the world, right? And the thing he learned from Arnold Schwarzenegger and from Bruce Willis uh and 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 all those guys is that becoming the biggest movie star in the world is a matter of promoting yourself. You can get the role in the movie, but how much extra promotional work are you going to do? How much time are you going to spend on the red carpet? How many uh, of, of the promotional interviews are you going to do? Because there's a direct correlation between how much self-promotion that an actor does and how well the movie does at the box office. And once Will Smith realized that, he was full steam ahead promoting the mess out of any and everything that he was doing. And that is how Will Smith became Will Smith. It is not a coincidence. I remember reading, oh my God, it, I used to read uh, WrestleZone.com. And I remember reading years ago, probably, whew, probably had to be like 2010, 2011, something like that, that The Miz was going above and beyond doing promotions for WWE, doing Make-A-Wishes and all this other stuff. He was doing all this stuff to help get his name out there. Plus, he had the notoriety from being on MTV reality shows, right? And then WWE decided to make him the champion, right? Because they could promote him more. So I said all that just to say, <coughs> all of these guys from Impact, right? Not just Tasha Steeles, but Moose, Trey Miguel, okay? Anybody who works for Impact, the best thing you can do is promote yourself. Get yourself hot. Because when you do that, then the company is going to see the value in promoting you more. If it's, it's weird. It's like a backwards thing, right? If they feel like they're the one that made you the star, then they're only going to promote you so much. But if they feel like you're already a star, then they'll go above and beyond to try and get you anywhere they can because they're happy and proud to be associated with you. They need to, you know, they, they want to like let everybody know that they're rubbing elbows with somebody who's a real star. So, um, so yeah, so I really don't want to see Tasha Steeles fall, you know, out of the, out of the mix here. You know what I mean? She's the impact knockouts champion and they do have her still doing the thing with Mickey James, but, um, yeah, I, I really just want to see her make sure she still just, you know, keeps promoting herself and doing everything she's got to do to keep her name hot. Because when it, uh, you know, when it comes time, when it, when it, when it comes time that they're done with the Chelsea green thing. And if, you know, who knows what's going to happen with Deanna Perrazzo, but Tasha stills, she needs to be able to say she did something as the knockouts champion. So another funny aspect to this whole Chelsea green thing, right? is she was gloating so hard about 
people uh, about, you know, about working the fans. And I've said this before, but I, I just, I, I have to say it one more time, right? Like, why do fans have such a problem with getting worked? You watch wrestling to get worked. Believe it or not, you do. Even if you don't know you do, you do. You watch wrestling to get worked, okay? Like, getting work means that the TV show is presenting something to you that feels realistic, and that's why you watch any TV show. You want to get lost in it. You want it to feel real. You want it to feel authentic. You want to have genuine emotions while you're consuming this product, right? So if they can make you feel like something is real, you should be all for that, right? Now, me, I... It's not that I necessarily pride myself on on trying to figure out the tricks, but when they sent the kayfabe doctor down the ringside, I knew that she wasn't really hurt, right? Like, you would get sued for that. If somebody was hurt, for real, and you sent a fake doctor to uh, come and check on them, they would sue you for that, okay? Anthem is a big company with a lot of money. They would not send the fake doctor to ringside for a real injury. So that was the green, uh, I mean, the, the red flag when she was doing the injury. But <clears throat> but I was not here arguing and debating about it, like, o- online. There was no reason to, like, why kill the fun, right? You know what I mean? Same thing, like, with Josh Alexander, right? Like, everyone's like, oh, no, Josh Alexander had a real thing. And we'll never know, right? We'll never know what, if there, if there was some actual lapsing of his his visa or whatever. We don't know if that's true. But what I did know is that the whole thing about him being off TV was 100% a storyline. 100% a storyline. If it wasn't part of the storyline, they wouldn't have been promoting it in the video package at the top of the show the next week, right? They wouldn't have had... Uh, honor no more mentioning Josh Alexander, you know, in Eddie Edwards is in his ex- explanation as to why he turned on impact. Josh Alexander was prominently featured in that monologue. Okay. Like there's no way that would have happened if they really had a question about whether or not Josh Alexander was going to be back on the TV. So you just got to pay attention to the, you know, to the storytelling, just pay attention to the storytelling. When they stop telling you someone's story, then they're not going to be on TV, right? That's that's that, right? If they're telling you this person is uh, is if they if they keep explaining to you why someone is off TV, and and if they keep uh, you know telling you how they're attached, you know, to something that's going on. The perfect example: When's the last time they mentioned Sammy Callahan? That's a real injury, okay? That's a real injury. That's somebody who's really working to get back. They they didn't even show you what actually happened to Sammy Callahan. Like we all just heard about that in the in the uh, dirt sheets. Are we still calling them dirt sheets? Let's say dirt sheets. We heard about that in the dirt sheets, but they didn't actually show that show what happened to him. And they did some sort of um, backstage angle where they pretended that Moose attacked him backstage. He got hurt in the ring. Um, so when when, they, when when an injury is real and somebody has to be taken off TV, they don't know what's going to happen with them. They don't make a story out of it. They don't build the content. They don't build the shows around it. That's just as the, it would be tacky if they did that anyway, right? It also would not be very smart because you know they could pull a Tessa on you and just decide. Ah, I'm not sure. No, 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 no. I don't care if I'm the champion. I'm not. I don't. I don't need to do this. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, enjoy getting work, people. Enjoy getting work. Getting work is fun, and that means you're enjoying what you're spending your time watching. Um, according to uh, PW Insider, the current lineup for Impact's multiverse of matches on April 1st at the Fairmont Hotel as part of WrestleCon over WrestleMania 38 weekend features Chris Saban versus Jay White, the Briscoes versus the Good Brothers, Eddie Edwards versus Tomohiri, Tomohiro Ishii, and an ultimate X match with the competitors to be announced. Also, uh, ROH and AAA Reina Derena's champion, Diana Perrazzo, is going to have a champ champ challenge. Uh, does that sound like an interesting card to you guys? See, for me, it's tough to just get excited about hearing a card because I don't like I don't know. I'm, I've never been a big like, like stargazer type of person. That said, WWE is excellent at presenting people like stars, right? They have them do like big things that make them feel like 
somebody who you'd want to see and be like, yo, remember that thing you did? Oh my God, right? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> Impact needs to do, do a better job of that. Because me personally, I enjoy the show, I enjoy the wrestling, but I don't like feel like, oh my God, if I saw Eddie Edwards at the airport, like, yo, dude, I need to, you know, like, he's just, oh, hey, I know him, he's, he's on the show. I'm not saying that's how you should be. I'm just saying that for me, they don't present them like a big enough stars where I'm like, I need to go out of my way to, you know, see this. Speaking of which, I do have tickets to Rebellion right now, and I don't think, I think there's a good chance I might not go to that show. Um, so if you guys, uh, are interested in maybe getting a couple of tickets to Rebellion, they're pretty good seats, um, go ahead and, uh, hit me up at TW Talking About on Twitter, and let me see if I can, um, let's see if we can figure something out. All right, so, um, now, that's pretty much it for the outside of the ring stuff with Impact this week. Let's get into this week's episode of Impact Wrestling, all right? So... We started out with the Bullet Club, Jay White and Chris Bay versus the Motor City Machine Guns, Chris Saban and Alex Shelley. Uh, this match was a banger. I'm not going to try to go move for move here and break it down. But if you didn't see it, this match was a banger. Um, if, if you are subscribed to the YouTube Insider, go out of your way to find this match and watch it. It was good. It was good, good. Um, uh, yeah. And the Motor City Machine Guns ended up winning. Um, one thing I didn't like, so the guns hit the skull and bones on Chris Bay, uh, to score the three count and Jay White just missed breaking up. Like it was so close that it actually, actually looked like it was kind of a mistake by the referee. So that could be a story going forward, uh, as to whether or not they have some sort of rematch. But what I don't want here is if Chris Bay is going to be teaming with Jay White, I don't want Chris Bay to be the guy out here eating all the pins. Cause I don't think that's very good for Chris Bay, right? Like, being in Bullet Club is supposed to be some sort of a boost to Chris Bay's profile. But if he's got to be the one eating all the pins in the matches, then he needs to get as far away from that as possible because I don't think that's doing him any favors. So let's see how that plays out going forward. Up next, we had Steve Macklin versus Rhino. Rhino is out for revenge after Steve Macklin cost him his match against Eddie Edwards at Sacrifice. Uh, Anthony Corelli, the former Santino Morella, was on commentary. That's one thing that I really like that Impact has been doing the past couple of weeks. They've been, like, constantly rotating the commentary. Like, if you guys have noticed that, we'll get Anthony Corelli pop in for a match or two. We'll get Brian Myers pop in for one match before Morrissey comes out and gets rid of him. We'll have Maria Canellas pop in on commentary during the I Don't Know More match. And, I don't know, it, it, this... I've never been a big commentary person. I've never been a big person to complain about the commentary. But I'd be interested to see what BQ has to say about this because he's been very uh, critical of Impact's commentary situation. And I think this is a great way to actually just keep it fresh. And I, I, listen, I, I, I'd be interested to see uh, you guys out there, what do you guys think of the commentary, the way they've been kind of rotating in a third person as the show goes on? I think it's actually pretty cool. It's been, it's been very clever, the way that they've kind of played that off. Uh, for different reasons, and it keeps the sound of the show fresh, so I like it. All right, we go backstage, and we see the inspiration. They forgive Caleb with a K and are under the impression that he was trying to help them retain the Knockouts World Tag Team Championships at Sacrifice, but inadvertently threw the title to Tennille Dashwood instead. Cassie Lee says that the next time, she knows Caleb will do the right thing. All right. <clears throat> then Heath tells Rhino that they're better as a unit. They, they they have like a Rhino was feeling a little depressed after losing to Steve Macklin. And um, Heath comes in and gets them hyped up. That they should be focused on being a tag team. So we'll see where that's going. Um, I'm interested to see if that's going to be like, I can't tell just from this one interaction. If this is a situation where Heath and Rhino are going to end up winning the tag team championship, which will probably be my bet. Or if Heath is going to end up getting turned on by Rhino and Rhino's going to go, you know, full-time bad guy, thereby giving Heath something interesting to do, interesting to do, um, you know, as a single. But Impact is already hurting for tag teams, so I don't know if, if you know, they want to break up one of the names that people would actually know. All right, we had Larry D versus uh, Bupinder Gajar. Uh, Bupinder Gajar won 
with the 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 spear uh, off the second rope in the in the corner. That's a nice looking move. Uh, after the match, W. Morrissey came out to terrorize Brian Myers, but Brian Myers ran away. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Rai Singh was outside the ring when Morrissey just happened to be out there. Morrissey grabbed him and power bombed him through the table. That BQE power bomb. Listen. Morrissey is doing the monster thing, and people like it. People are responding to it. It's almost like Wardlow, right? Like a Wardlow, even a Kevin Nash. People love seeing a big dude just power bomb other people into oblivion. It's a formula that works. Hey, and I would say Morrissey is probably a full-on babyface now, right? So you think he eventually is going to find his way back to uh, a title match with Moose, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when that time comes. So after qualifying for the Triple Threat X Division title match at Rebellion, Ace Austin is sure that his new friend Mike Bailey will do the same. And uh, he tells him backstage, he's like, hey, you know, let's look out for each other. And Mike Bailey kind of gives him a pat on the cheek. He's like, I'm sure one of us will win the match. So that's interesting, right? They're kind of sowing some seeds of dissent. It feels like there's a swerve coming, right? Like, they wanted us to think that Ace Austin is manipulating Mike Bailey, right? But this would kind of suggest that maybe Mike Bailey is not as naive as Ace Austin thinks he is. So it's interesting to see where this is possibly going. All right, let's see. Honor No More sent a message to Josh Alexander ahead of his match with Matt Taven in the main event. But then Alicia, Alicia Edwards interrupts and demands to speak to her husband. Alicia tells him that she chose Impact Wrestling over Honor No More and hopes that one day he'll wake up and realize the mistake he's made. I'm not convinced that Alicia Edwards is not going to end up joining Honor No More. What else does she have to do, for one? Also, um, I think that could be a nice little swerve if people are thinking that Alicia is the thing that can bring Eddie back to the good side and then, you know, she helps him pull a swerve to beat Josh Alexander or somebody. Which I wouldn't mind, by the way, because I don't think Josh Alexander should get the title at, the, at Rebellion. I think they should extend the chase. Extend the chase. Make it a year-long thing. Make him keep chasing, putting obstacles in his way between now and Bound for Glory. And I, listen, make, make the people really want the payoff. Um, all right. So then we have the Champ Champ Challenge. Deanna Perrazzo versus Giselle Shaw and Lady Frost. This match was actually better than I thought it was going to be. Um, th their timing was good. You know, they didn't have as many botches as I expected. I think three-way matches are just hard to pull off no matter who you are. And, um, and I gotta say, you know, all, all three of these athletes did a really good job, you know, with the execution. And, and there was one part where they did like a, a, a triple German suplex. And I think that just, it looks like such a hard thing to do just cause you got to get the timing right. And it's otherwise it's going to look crazy. And you know, they, they nailed that, but there was a lot of spots like that where all three of them had to work together to pull off some sort of move. I thought they did a really good job. So this is a good match. Um, Diana Perrazzo hit the queen's gambit on, um, Lady Frost, I believe it was, to to get the win. So it was um it, it, again, it was a good match. Definitely worth watching if you haven't seen this ep this week's episode. All right, in an interview with Gia Miller, Josh Alexander vows to take care of Honor No More tonight so that he can focus on reclaiming the Impact World Title from Moose at Rebellion. Alexander reminds us that Moose has until the end of the night to sign the contract for the world title match or be stripped of the championship. Scott Demore grants the Good Brothers their Impact World Tag Team title match against Violent by Design next week, but this time it's going to be a lumberjack match. Demore also reveals that the winners of this match will go on to Rebellion and defend the titles in the first ever eight-team elimination tag match. Wow. Woo! That sounds like a cluster. An eight-team elimination tag match? I'd rather an eight-team gauntlet match, which sounds like that could take forever, but eight-team, an eight-team elimination tag? Woo! They're, they're going to have to do some really creative booking to make that seem interesting because I feel like if you got, if you got eight teams, that's 16 people. Like, 
How could you possibly focus on any one or two people and care about who they are and what they're doing in this match? That's just like, if all 16 people are out there at one time, that's going to be a rough, ugly watch. It's probably going to be tough to shoot, right? Like, like where do you put the cameras so where people aren't standing in the way? Because if you got 16 people, the whole ring is going to be either everybody crowded inside the ring or people inside the ring and outside the ring or everybody standing around the ring apron, which again, how do you shoot that? Like, that sounds like there's a whole lot of problems here they need to figure out in order for this to come off not looking like hell. All right. Uh, Jonah got, uh, excuse me, Jonah destroyed Zicky Dice. Uh, <laughs> Zicky Dice, man. Zicky Dice and Jonah are like complete opposites, right? Like you got one guy who's destroying everything in his path, looking amazing, and the other guy looking like uh, Zicky Dice. So after the match, PCO is wheeled out on a stretcher, and he sits up and confronts Jonah in the middle of the ring, leading to a huge brawl between the two giants. PCO launches himself off the top rope and takes out members of security with the D animator as Jonah retreats up the ramp. I got to say this. Jonah has been super duper dope, right? Super duper dominant. And he looks like a big deal. The real deal. I don't like the idea of him being in a long-term competitive program with PCO. Like PCO... It's, it's not going to help. It's not going to help PCO to beat Jonah. But it will hurt Jonah a lot to lose to PCO. Feel me? So it doesn't make sense to, like, like you're, you're not going to have PCO beat Jonah and then all of a sudden PCO is an attraction. That's just not going to happen, right? It's just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but Jonah is pretty established, man. And, um, and, I think I'm ready to see Jonah as a as a challenger for the world title. Whether he wins or not, like he has just steamrolled everybody they put in front of him to the point where you have to legitimately see this guy as world a world championship contender. And I think it'd obviously be great for Moose if Moose gets a win over Jonah. Um, but Jonah, man, like that dude looks amazing. His match he had with Josh Alexander, uh, I think at the last pay per view. That match was amazing. So I think Jonah um, is a guy who they should be trying to do big things with while they have him. Who knows how long they have him. But while they got him, they should be, you know, trying to do some big things with him. Uh, and, and, and PCO ain't it. All right. After Knockouts World Champion Tasha Steeles attacked Mickie James during her concert, Gia Miller reveals that their Knockouts World title match next week will now be a street fight. Chelsea Green wants to be in the corner of Mickie James to help combat the threat of Savannah Evans, but Mickey declines her offer to protect her already injured arm. Hmm. Huh. Chelsea Green has, has an injured arm. Who knew? All right, Masha Slamovich. Uh, uh, Masha Slamovich absolutely destroyed this young woman. I'm a big fan of enhancement matches. And by the way, the reason why you do it and you do it repetitively is so you can train your audience, right? Like, I didn't have any idea who Masha Slamovich was before she started appearing on Impact. But she's been coming out here dusting people week after week after week. And now she looks like a killer to me. So when I see her pop up on the TV, I expect her to smoke somebody. And that's the whole point, right? The, the, the gimmick is working. All right. Zicky Dice is feeling down after yet another loss earlier tonight. Gia Miller suggests that he goes back to wrestling school in order to improve. Luckily for Dice, there was a promo for Swinger's Dungeon, and spots are now open. Um, so we're going to get a combination of Zicky Dice and uh, Johnny Swinger. This should be interesting. All right. Uh, we have Matt Taven. Hi, Matt Taven. Uh, versus Josh Alexander. This was a good one. Uh, let's see. Following last week's confrontation between Josh Alexander and Honor No More, Alexander looks to deal a blow to the Renegade group in tonight's main event versus Matt Taven. Maria Canellis joins Tom Hannafin and Matthew Raywalt on commentary. Taven takes Alexander off the top rope as he targets his left arm. Taven hits a flatliner, then floats over into a submission. Alexander connects with the German suplex, but... 
Taven shuts him down with a twisting neck breaker. Taven attempts a springboard moonsault, but Alexander gets his knees up to create separation. Taven avoids a C4 spike and hits the purple thunder bomb. Taven remains in control with just the tip. That's that's weird. Uh, Alexander hits a running cross body to the back of Taven, and Alexander counters the climax into the ankle lock, but Taven gets to the ropes. Alexander connects with a suplex, followed by a C4 spike to win. Reading these out does not do it justice. Um, this was a really good match. Matt Taven can go. Josh Alexander can go. This was a really good match. I definitely wouldn't mind seeing it again. Before the show goes off the air, we see Impact World Champion Moose at the home of Josh Alexander in Canada. He gives the signed contract for his Rebellion World title match against Alexander to his wife, Jade Chung, and tells her that since they live so close to Anthem headquarters, he thought she could drop it off in the morning. Jade takes the contract and demands that Moose leaves as Impact goes off the air. Listen, I gotta say this. The scene with Moose showing up to Josh Alexander's house. Now, in wrestling, everything's been done a million times, but... It was just very creepy. The way he just pulled up, walks in, and, you know, hands the, you know, hands the contract to, to Jay Chung. You know, basically, almost just kind of insinuating, like, yo, I'm here, I'm watching you, I could come get you at any time. And she's, like, there with the kid. Man, that's just a creepy way to send a message. And it, any man, any man is going to be in the mood for blood. After something like that, if somebody does, if somebody shows up to your house and, you know, creepily sends a message to your wife, whoo, man, it, it's, it's really nothing left to talk about at that point. So, um, so, you know, adding another layer to the impact world champion moose, Josh Alexander story. This is getting good, man. This is getting good. You gotta like. You know, you gotta like all the the storytelling they're doing. For for as much as we talk about and critique what Impact can do better, if you just look at the guts of this story, this is a good story, man. This is a good story. They have done a lot to uh, to to build up Josh Alexander to talk about the importance of of you know why this is important to him. You know, taking you along his hero's journey to try and get that title. And, um, and listen, if you just put everything else to the side, I'll say this. If this story was going on on Monday Night Raw, it would be the talk of wrestling. It would be the talk of wrestling. If this story was going on on AEW, it would be the talk of wrestling. This is a really good story, man. This is a really good story. Um, and again, I do think that Impact needs to do some things to make Josh Alexander feel like a bigger deal. Because he's got every tool. He can cut a great promo. We know he can cut a, he, he can do a great match. Um, like he's, he is like the total package as a wrestler. But again, if Josh Alexander was in WWE, I see Kurt Angle, man. I see it. I see the wrestling skill. I see the, the pro, the better than you would think promo. And again, the rest, you gotta, you, you gotta produce it, right? Like think of Kurt Angle's music. Dun, dun, sh, sh, dun, dun, sh, dun, dun. Dun, dun. Right, like that's production, right? Like the the um the 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 pyro, you know, all of that stuff that you're, that you're used to seeing. But that's all production, man. And Impact, they can produce up some good reactions, some good situations for Josh Alexander, and they should, man. They should because he's got the tools to be a star. You've got to present him like a star. Got to, got to, got to, got to. All right, guys. So that was this week's episode of Impact Wrestling. I just wanted to get you guys with a, a, a real quick little, you know, touch base. Just let you guys know we didn't forget about you. Uh, sometimes life gets in the way, people. Sometimes life gets in the way. And uh, we have not been able to get you guys an episode in a couple of days. But the episodes are going to keep coming back. They're going to start coming back. Um, just be patient with us, all right? So, um, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at TW Talking About. You can follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod on, uh, on Twitter. 
And you can also go to the Talking About Pod YouTube channel and give that a follow. Got some episodes coming up that you guys should like and enjoy. Um, Follow the Impact Lounge. Follow BQ. And if you guys like this show, the most important thing you can do for us is tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. For BQ, I'm TW. We'll see you soon. Peace.